so we are at this scary point where anything you say can and will be used against you. Not just today, not just with the value systems and laws of today, but the, law, but the value system and, and laws 10 years into the future, 20 years into the future, 50 years into the future. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends, and Happy New Year. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you in a conversation that's being recorded on the 2nd of January, 2017. And for some reason, that number sounds futuristic to me. But here we are, and unfortunately, it's not a necessarily happy future that we're stumbling headfirst into, but it's one that we nonetheless need to prepare ourselves for. And on that very note, for the first conversation of the new year, I have lined up a conversation with Rick Falkvinch, uh, who I'm sure will be familiar to a large portion of the audience as the founder of the original Pirate Party, i.e. the Swedish Pirate Party. But he is also the head of privacy at privateinternetaccess.com, and it is in that capacity that we're going to be speaking to him today about a very interesting story, and one that, uh, again, has implications for everyone all around the world, me in Japan, uh, himself in Europe, everyone else who's listening to this conversation, and we'll take this from a blog post that Rick put up at privateinternetaccess.com on December 1st, 2016, so this is a month old, and this story might have gotten lost in the news, uh, the crazy news feed that we've had over the last month or two, but this is an important story, and the title that uh, was on this Rick Falkvinge uh, post was Today... The FBI becomes the enemy of every computer user and every IT security professional worldwide. A pretty ambitious title, but it is absolutely true. So, reading from the beginning of that blog post, uh, Rick wrote, Today, December 1st, the United States FBI is granted new powers to intrude into any computer anywhere on the globe, instantly changing the FBI from a random law enforcement agency to a global adversary. Law enforcement agencies are expected to be met with open arms and treated as good guys. There's not going to be any good guy treatment of the FBI here, and for good reason. All right, so Rick, thank you very much for joining us today on the program. Tell us about this Rule 41 that came into effect on December 1st, 2016, and how and why it affects people all over the globe. Thank you for having me on the show, James. It's great to be here. So Rule 41 is basically when you want something to pass... The trick from a legislative viewpoint is to make it sound as mind-numbingly boring as possible so people just won't care about it. So changes to Rule 41, like how boring can you get? But what's behind this little Rule 41 is when the FBI can actively intrude into somebody's computer, somebody's electronic equipment, effectively the, the uh, electronic equi- equivalent of breaking and entering into your door with guns drawn. This is violence against your equipment, this is violence against your rights, this is invading your privacy. But the changes to Rule 41 means that for a single warrant... Actually, let's back up a little bit here. It used to be that they needed a warrant for intruding into a particular home, which is what we associate with a search warrant, right? somebody knocking, we have a search warrant, please open or we'll break the door down. What happened in this changes to Rule 41 was that the FBI could suddenly get a warrant for more than five devices at a time, depending on an investigation or an ongoing trend or even a department. And it is important here to realize that that more more than five does not typically mean six or seven. It typically means six or seven million as in there's no upper limit here. So what we're seeing is that all of a sudden the FBI got a right to intrude into people's computers worldwide. And if we're backing up again, uh, another bit, uh, this was because of jurisdictional problems when the FBI was investigating some sort of international crime in cooperation with its international counterparts. So just like the FBI can't get a search warrant to, to knock down the, uh, the door of somebody in Berlin, Germany, they would need to, to, to contact the German Bundespolizei to do that. But all of a sudden, the FBI got the right from the U.S. authority to knock down that door in Berlin electronically. And not just in Berlin, anywhere in the world. So what this means is that you now have a global adversary in the United States Bureau, Federal Bureau of Investigation, 
that can and will intrude into electronic equipment. And there are so many things that are worrying with this that I'm not sure where to start. To begin with, jurisdiction is there for a reason. The reason the United States cannot legally, or an agency in the uh, United States, law enforcement agency in the United States, could not legally break and enter into equipment or our residence in Germany is because Germany is under a different set of laws to begin with. So, the FBI is now taking on itself to enforce U.S. laws, U.S. code, and it doesn't care where it does so on the globe. It might not know in the first place, which was the justification for, for, some, of, for some of this rule change. Because if you have an IP address and it's in it under layers and layers and layers and layers of encryption and privacy, then you'd, the FBI won't know whether, where this is. But it's important. The second thing here is that the seeing how the FBI is now breaking into a server in Germany or Angola or Japan or wherever, that makes them efficiently, effectively no different from a random criminal anywhere else in the world. Because the German Bundespolizei sure, sure as hell didn't give the FBI the right to intrude into any server in Germany. They're just a random criminal as far as the German Bundespolizei is concerned. Which gives a whole set of this world police and holier than thou tensions a new level. And What's really concerning is the two things about this, as far, apart from jurisdiction. First, the scale of it. We've seen when the NSA is given permission to intrude on somebody, that they're doing it now by the millions. I saw a, a, a number, I think it was ending the Citizen Four movie, the Oscar-winning movie from Laura Poitras about Edward Snowden and how he came out and exposed the NSA that there's now well over a million people just on the special watch list. And that's getting ridiculous. There is no justification for having several million people getting special being specially watched. That's when you're overreaching by far. The second thing here is that there is a very dangerous conflict of interest. Because when the agencies that are supposed to keep us safe, like law enforcement, the, the ultimate role of a government is to guarantee our security, internally and externally, meaning that it's supposed to keep us safe from crime in, within the country, it's supposed to see, keep us safe from aggression from outside of the country. Internal and external security is supposed to be the core function of a government. But when the government agency becomes dependent on vulnerabilities of our equipment to do their job, or worse, to have a an easier time doing their job, so it becomes the path of least resistance for doing their job. There is a very apparent conflict of interest where these agencies, these governments that are supposed to keep us safe, will strive to do the exact opposite because it helps their mass surveillance efforts. And this is just not very well thought true at the end of the day. It's just somebody thinking, well, this would be useful, and at the end of the day, in the pub, somebody yeah. asks a very right question. What the hell just happened? And that's where we are right now. Well, that, uh, that isn't even a theoretical concern, because we've already seen the, the active collaboration between government and big tech that has created well, so many yeah, yeah. poles, backdoors, and, and other ways uh, for government, of course, to gain access, which means anyone, any criminal of any intent, to gain access. Um, so let's back up for a moment. For those who aren't aware, this is part of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, which again is the U.S. Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, uh, specifically in Title VIII. Uh, Rule 41 is called Search and Seizure, and it's laying out, as you say, the different rules for getting a, wor a search warrant. Um, but it's interesting to note, and I'll throw the link in the show notes as always so that people can go read it for themselves. This this uh, section is, is relatively short, but the notes on the amendments that have been added over the years is very voluminous, uh, which I think speaks to the volumes, to the way that uh, the idea of a search warrant has changed over the years, obviously with 2016 being no exception with some of the uh, huge changes that they just passed um, to Rule 41 uh, that you've been pointing out. But uh, let's play devil's advocate here for a moment on the side of the Department of Justice, who would argue that this is 
Uh, first of all, nothing new. It's just a clarification of existing standards uh, by which search warrants are issued. And secondly, since it is a search warrant, it will require probable cause. So if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about, right? This is an, ex this is an excellent rebuttal, and it's what you would hear when talking to people on the street. It's what you would hear in a legal debate. So it's very good to know how to respond to this. And let's take it one at a time. First, it requires probable cause. Well, yes, as in we have a probable cause that crime is happening, so we are starting to look for all the systems that might be involved in this. You have a botnet of a million computers. There's your probable cause. All of a sudden, one million households now are now subject of this probable cause. So it's, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe that the probable cause goes, that the bar is now as low as can assist in an investigation. It's not even that you need to be under particular and individual and prior suspicion of a serious crime, which used to be the bar. It's now that if it helps their job in any way, they might intrude on your privacy, even if you weren't even peripherally involved in wrongdoing. It just, if it just, if it helps their investigation. And this, if it's nothing, if I haven't got done anything wrong, I don't have anything to hide. That's, a, that, let me go down that track in a minute. Because I want to, I want to explore, I want to explore the future a little, a little more here. Because this is, we can see hints of what's coming just around the corner here. And I'd like to go back to 1970s science fiction to, see some par int very interesting parallels about what's happening right now in society. Some of Isaac Asimov's work, the, the guy who laid out the three laws of robotics, a robot may not harm a human being or allow a human being to come to harm, was the first law. The second law, um, a robot must obey a human, except for doing so conflicts with the first law. And third law, a, mu a robot must preserve its own health and well-being, except for doing so conflicts with the second or first laws. This was interesting in that there had, in, in one of Asimov's books, there the, called The Naked Sun, there had been a murder on a faraway planet which was mostly populated by robots and humans, people didn't really like to meet each other anymore because robots fulfilled all, all the needs. And so this human detective went to the residence where a murder had taken place and started interviewing all the robots who were perfect witnesses to the, to the crime and who were objective witnesses and had perfect memory. And reading this book as a teenager, I thought it was perfectly reasonable setup. Like, of course you would want to ask the robots around the house what, what had taken place. And then I sort of fast forward to today and realized that, you know, that's kind of exactly what's happening. When you have an Amazon Echo and police want to ask, what ha ask this particular robot, what did you hear? Only they're going to Amazon to ask, what did this robot hear? That's exactly what was happening on this faraway planet in the science fiction. And so I think this that seemed reasonable in the 1970s, all of a sudden has enormous privacy implications for present day. Because we don't, when we buy a toaster, we don't see it as a subject with its own agency that is able to respond to police questions about our behavior. When we buy a robot, when we buy a television set, we don't think as these gadgets as witnesses to everything that's happening in our living room. We don't see uh, them as, a, as having potential agency against us. Whereas if we had a more humanoid robot, we might be able to anthropomorphize it and, and think of it as a subject of its own. But we don't see the gadgets as having this agency. And so it's only a form away from these science, these science fiction books. As in, they don't, our television set doesn't stand on two legs and walks around. And therefore, we don't think of it as a subject in its own right. So there is a leap here, which is happening right now, where can robots be witnesses to crime? And if they can, which is easier to argue that it's reasonable, then who has agency and who has not? Who can coerce agency? Who can coerce 
a subject, if it has agency? These are very, very big questions, and they're happening right now, which leads us back to Rule 41 and, and the FBI, who can coerce electronic equipment to give up data. In the FBI case, they are intruding using violence, using vulnerabilities, using weaknesses that may or may not have been deliberately planted. We have seen examples of deliberately planted weaknesses in, uh, I saw one in a Huawei router, Chinese equipment. There have been other backdoors planted with or without the knowledge and consent of management and governments. But we know, for example, that governments are taking themselves to the right to use this kind of force. Look, for example, at the infamous national security letters of the United States, which means that the Department of Justice or Department of Homeland Security sends a letter to a, a, a corporation and force, coercing their assistant and gagging them to ever talk about this assistant taking place in the first time, in the first place. So we are at a time now where a corporation's government and jurisdiction needs to be part of a threat model. And we don't think in those terms yet. We don't think in terms of, is this corporation based in the United States? If so, the corporation does not have agency to promise me privacy, which is why private internet access has servers all over the world uh, as, a, as a sidetrack here. And we are just... Anywhere it turns out that private internet access doesn't have agency to promise privacy, we just shut down. We did that in Russia, for example, when Russia tried to seize our servers. They didn't get anything because they were encrypted. And at the time, they, they just, and we just never brought them back up because if we can't trust the government, there's a very real threat to privacy. So those were a lot of different diverging and trying to paint the bigger picture here of what's going on. We have, we are moving into the bigger question of who has agency and who can coerce. And those are fundamental questions as we're moving into the Internet of Things, where your scale is going to tell on you that, maybe to your insurance company, that, hey, Rick gained weight and his body's fat is going up too. And then the treadmill t tells my insurance company, and his heartbeat is going up when he's jogging. He's not, not taking care of himself. You should raise his premiums. This is five years away, at most. So, these questions aren't being asked, and I'm really concerned about that. The, the, these changes to Rule 41 is just one part of a very, very big picture that all goes toward government using coercion against agency of electronic equipment that is, frankly, monitoring everything we do today. And again, just to back you up on this, this is ripped right from the headlines where there is an ongoing uh, murder case in Arkansas where the police are attempting to subpoena Amazon itself for the Amazon Echo records of the, uh, the person in, pers in question. So Exactly. I brought this up as an example. I mean, yes. that there's, there's also that question, like, do you have the right to coerce the robot, the Amazon Echo unit? And if you can't coerce that unit, maybe you can coerce the, a third party, Amazon, where the, where the people get being investigated don't even have agency to refuse giving out the data. And given Bezos and his $600 million contract from the CIA, it all circles back around the same um, toilet bowl, unfortunately. So uh, it's just, it, it, there are so many different related and important concepts here that it is difficult to narrow it down to, to any one of them because they all interlock. Let's get back to the, the question then. For people who are concerned about this, obviously the first thing that people will think to do is encryption. Encrypt your traffic, encrypt your uh, connection so that you cannot be uh, so easily uh, uh, penetrated by the FBI and other would-be uh, penetrators of information. But wait, if you're encrypting your traffic, if you're trying to make yourself anonymous, doesn't that actually cross that threshold of probable cause? It does, and that's another problem. I mean, I don't know if this was related to the rules of for, the changes to Rules 41, but I saw it in the context of those changes, that act actively encrypting your traffic or using a, an, what did they call it? An identity concealment procedure or some legal mumbo-jumbo like that. 
anyway, wanting to stay anonymous, wanting to exercise the rights you have under the U.S. Bill of Rights, the European Charter of Human Rights, and so on, and many, many similar documents, makes you a suspect and gives the law, en law enforcement agencies probable cause to invade your privacy. I mean, this is such a ridiculous catch-22. Do you have the right to privacy? Yes, unless you actually try to enforce it, in which case you don't anymore. Like, I'm sorry, but that's just bullshit. So let's go back to this question you asked. If you don't have anything to hide, you don't have anything to fear. Because I'd, I'd like to drill down into that a little bit. The uh, first obvious, th there are four layers of rebuttal to that that are each very important. And they start out by being fairly obvious, but not so important, to being not obvious at all and absolutely crucial. The first rebuttal is that the rules may change. Once the surveillance is in place, the rules which are being enforced by that surveillance may change to something you don't agree with at all. For example, if we're taking an extreme example, which really isn't that extreme because it's already happening, if you agree to having cameras in households to prevent domestic abuse, which is a laudable goal and whatnot, the next election, some party, some really fundamentalist conservative party, which wants to outlaw homosexual relations, might, might come into power. And now this party, this administration, has cameras into every household. And so you're turning what used to be beneficial surveillance, as far as you were concerned, into something that's absolutely dystopic and tyrannical. And we've seen a little of this wake up in the U.S. intelligence community that, oh, Obama was so good, so we didn't mind invading everybody's privacy then. But now there's a new president taking charge, and we're not really comfortable with this anymore. I'm sorry, but you should have thought of that bloody earlier. The second thing is that it doesn't matter if you think you're white as snow. It doesn't matter if you're not literally not doing anything wrong. Because what matters is how people will interpret what you're doing. How automated systems will look for th patterns and activities that don't match these patterns and put a big fat red flag on your record. If I'm pausing at a bar on my way every, home, every day home from work because they happen to serve the best deer meatballs on the planet and I love their deer meatballs with mashed potatoes then the Department of Driving Licenses will draw certain conclusions from me stopping at a bar and keeping driving from that bar every day home from work and revoke my driving license I will eventually get it back maybe but it'll cause me to think twice about how does this look as opposed to um, is what I'm doing legal and completely in the clear? Having, de having meatballs at the wrong place can cost me my driving license. Let's go one step further. In, um, in many cities, in many countries, sex work is still illegal. And so if I were stopping at the uh, principal area where sex work takes place, every Friday evening. Some sort of social department would draw conclusions from that. They would not care that what I was doing was helping my grandmother with her weekly groceries because she happens to live there. So I would stop there for two hours to help her shop, carry up her groceries and so on and so forth. Which is absolutely indisputably doing a good deed from every aspect and so on. But the people seeing my behavior, seeing how my car is moving, will draw completely different conclusions. And that would probably cost me not my, just my job, but also my family, custody, custody of my children, and so on. I might eventually win in court, at which point I would all still have lost custody of my children permanently. And winning, that, that is not my idea of winning. And it's important here that as point two and a half, this assumes the system, systems even have correct data which, time and again, they haven't had. Actually, let's just skip to point four directly here. 
Because at the end of the day, this is about that we have a deep psychological need for privacy. When you say, if you want privacy, then you're a bad person. You might as well say that if you need food, you're a bad person. If you need water, you're a bad person. If you need love and intimacy and social recognition, you're a bad person. Because in every single society, in every single surveillance society, people have responded with carving out small niches where they could have at least something to themselves. Let's take a concrete example. When I'm going to the men's room, I lock the door behind me. That's not because I'm a criminal. That's not because something secret that I want to hide is going on there. It's fairly obvious, frankly, what happens in the men's room when I lock the door behind me. But I think I have a right to have that to myself. And that, at the end of the day, is what privacy is about. Even if it's nothing bad, most of the time it's not. We have a right to keep some things to ourselves. And that's a very deep human psychological need. And that is completely overlooked in the debate. Well, uh, all very good points. So let's cut to the chase, which is, well, okay, so the FBI is the enemy of computer users all over the world. And whether you're part of some botnet without knowing about it, or even if you're not, even if there's just some other reason that uh, the FBI has found interest in you and wants to intrude into your systems, they may be doing it at the moment. They may choose to do it later. You may never know precisely. Um, you may never know. Doing. Exactly. So, That's part of... Hmm? So the question becomes... Well, if the FBI is the enemy weapon system here, what can people do to protect themselves from this? There are two major aspects of this. One is protecting your data in transmission. The other is protecting your data in storage. And the third would be protecting your sensors. Protecting your data in transmission is a matter of always encrypting. Encrypt your mail, encrypt your browsing, use EFFs, uh, HTTPS everywhere, use their Let's Encrypt, use a VPN or Tor if you can. Make sure that you never send data in clear text. It might not just be the FBI. Frankly, it's just a matter of good data hygiene, good information hygiene at this point, that to always send data encrypted. Second, all my machines in around here, it doesn't show on camera, but I have a number of machines. I'm a nerd, so there, that's, there's no big surprise there. They're all encrypted. If somebody flicks the main power switch, they don't come back up. I need to manually unlock all of them. That is another layer of security. If there's a search and seizure physically in my residence, then nobody gets anything. And there's many good reasons for that. For example, I have Bitcoin. If the key to Bitcoin leaks, I lose all the money. So there's not just a matter of privacy here. There's also some very financial interest in preventing law enforcement and everybody else from accessing my data. And another, another thing I find useful is to keep an open wireless network. For my neighbors, being good neighbors, sharing my bandwidth. Because what that means is that when somebody is using my net to do something, be it legal, illegal, I don't care, because the key being I'm not responsible for what somebody else does with my network. I'm not responsible for what they do. And that gives me plausible deniability for anything that happens coming out of my IP address. So while that might make you a target, it also gives you complete deniability for what cannot be proven from your machines. And while this sounds as concealing wrongdoing, let's go back and remember that wrongdoing is entirely subjective. And if you're looking to the government to be a guide of ethics, you're going to come away deeply, deeply disappointed. So what can people do? Use a VPN, use encryption in transmission, in storage, and disconnect the sensors you, you can. Most of them you cannot disconnect. So be sensitive to be, be aware of when there are sensors around you and that they will, at the end of the day or just five years out, be seen as those robots in the naked sun on the planet Solaris 
who's, who law enforcement can ask exactly what happened here on this particular day in history. Because we're not that far out, and in many cases, that's already the case. Well, I uh, remain skeptical of the idea that we can truly anonymize ourselves from a dedicated agency like the NSA that truly wants to access your data, if they really do, on the individual level. But uh, as you say, it's protecting yourself from everyone, including criminals and random other people, as well as not making the law enforcement job any easier for them so that you won't be caught in some giant dragnet just by accident. Um, So extremely important. It is. I mean, it's a matter of what is the, how much resources does your advers- adversary have? Exactly. If somebody with, say, a pen wanted to break into my home, they would likely fail. If they came with a, a battalion of Katyusha rockets and w- would be prepared to level the entire block to get into my flat or at least get me out of it, they would, I would not be able to resist that. Same thing with the NSA and the FBI. If you're just a random IP address on, on the net, man, why bother? If they're putting $3 billion into intruding into your systems, you're going to have a hard time resisting that. So part of, part of my defense and part of is making sure that I look like an ordinary person toward the public interface, if, you're, if you like, And when there's something really sensitive, I make sure to never have electronic devices nearby when I discuss it. Like, you need to be aware of how sensitive is what you're discussing, not just today, but also in the future. And being aware of, can I discuss this safely here? That's where we've, that's what we've come to. The telescreen that Winston was looking at and which would pick up any sound, we're, we're there now. Siri is here. Xbox is here. Amazon Echo is here. They are listening, and that data they are is listening. not only yeah, it's not only here today. It'll listening. be here ten years from now, a hundred years from exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, James, can you can you predict how laws will change in ten years? In twenty? No. So, exactly. So, we are at this scary point where anything you say can and will be used against you. Not just today. Not just with the value systems and laws of today. But the law, but the value system and, and laws 10 years into the future, 20 years into the future, 50 years into the future. I'm sure that there are people alive today that if you heard what they said 50 years ago, they would come out, they, they would appear as being horrible, horrible people. That's going to be a real challenge 50 years from today because we're going to be around. And people will be able to hold what we said against us. And I'm sure anyone who has held the Oval Office, for example, would uh, be perfectly blackmailable if everything they had ever said was recorded and stored on a data system. Oh, wait, it's probably already happening. So there you go. Completely, completely. Let's take a sidetrack there. You saw Optic Nerve, the, the uh, Yahoo program. The, this was a GCHQ program, I believe, targeting Yahoo, where they actually tapped into webcams. And so they were recording video conversations between other people, some of which were nude and therefore highly sensitive. The key thing, as you point out here, is not that the senator had a nude conversation. The key thing that makes it useful for the NSA is the senator had a, youth con- had a nude conversation with somebody who was not their spouse. They don't really care about seeing the nude pictures. What they do care about is having the leverage against adversaries in Congress. And that's where it gets scary. Huh, this is a very <laughs> very deep, very scary conversation in a lot of ways. So let's try to finish on something of a more positive note. Uh, this is your first time on the program, and perhaps there are people out there who haven't heard of your work before. So why don't you introduce us a little bit to yourself and the work that you do? Lovely. So... In 2006, I founded the Swedish Pirate Party. We were founded on the ideals of privacy, on shared culture, and, f- and freedom to innovate. Essentially, being adversaries of the copyright industry and the way they're cracking down on the internet, and having something as conservative, if you like, as the rights of our parents, br- bringing, r- bringing that with us to our children. Something as simple as sending an anonymous letter, having the right to walk about anonymously in public, All of these are rights that our parents had. 
sending something anonymously to anybody else without being tracked for it. And our children don't. So we were quite successful on less than 1% of our competition's budget. We became the biggest party in the sub-30 demographic, which everybody's gunning for, the youth vote. And uh, we did that on a budget of 50,000 euros. Our, our competition had 6 million between them, so we were more than two orders of magnitude more cost-efficient in actually succeeding in changing policy. I later wrote a book about this methodology we used called SwarmWise. looks like this. You can get it for free online as a PDF or, or buy it from Amazon. And it highlights how this methodology where you enroll a lot of volunteers simply on the basis that they get better leverage for their efforts when working through your organization than they would have done on their own. So you create a huge loose network of people who just move generally in the right direction. And that's when you get this two orders of magnitude as cost efficiency. It's filled with very tactical advice in terms of practical, practical advice and so on in, in how you build a, a global movement. And today I'm working as a head of privacy for privateinternetaccess.com. And what attracted me to, to this particular VPN company was that they take privacy seriously. As you said, we take privacy seriously because I'm working with private internet access .com at this point. As in, we do not log. If there's a log, it's vulnerable. If there's a log, it can be subpoenaed. And as to, be, to the best of my knowledge, we're the only VPN company where there is a public court record saying that we try to subpoena this company, but they don't have any logs. And that, that makes me... Uh, both happy and proud to be part of that team. Absolutely so. Well, I am going to throw the link into Swarmwise uh, on fuckvinge.net uh, in the show notes so that people can read that. I hope they do so because I hope to have you on in the future to talk more about that aspect of the work that you do so that we can we can look forward to things that people can be actively doing. I think that's an excellent idea and really does, I think, coincide quite nicely with my vision of open source collaborative journalism as the next step. It does, forward. it does. So. It does. Thank you, James. I was looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, not a happy uh, topic, but one that people definitely do need to be facing. So I'm glad that you're here to, uh, to help us understand some of this. Again, the links to all the things that we've mentioned today will be in the show notes for this episode. Rick Fogvinge, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Been a pleasure. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.